Senator Joe Lieberman from Connecticut passed away yesterday at the age of 82. I'm going to have some thoughts about Senator Lieberman and what his rise and fall in American politics tells us about the state of American Jewry in 2024. That and some recent polls on American support for Israel coming up on In Focus. Last night, we received the sad news that the, at the age of 82 and following a fall, Senator Joe Lieberman from Connecticut passed away at the age of 82. The, the news of his, his passing uh, provoked a lot of thoughts, and I decided that I really wanted to spend this time together talking about him because in many ways, his political career, including his post-Senate uh, career, tracked very closely with the rise and the fall of Americans in, 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 of American Jews in American politics. Senator Joe Lieberman um, came into politics, I think, in 1970 when he ran as a state representative in uh, Connecticut, and then he served as the attorney general of the state of Connecticut um, until he decided to run for office to the U.S. Senate at, in 1988. 1988 was sort of a high water mark for America in general and for American Jews specifically. Um, it was the end of the Reagan era. The United States was high flying uh, economically after the recession of the 1970s. Reaganomics had really unlocked the potential of the American economy. The United States was on the verge of winning the Cold War with so the Soviet Union's sclerotic leadership having been replaced by Mikhail Gorbachev, who launched the Glasnost and Perestroika programs that eventually led to the end of the Soviet Union in 1985. Um, American Jews had seen significant uh, accomplishments in American politics, particularly in the area of Soviet Jewry. There was a massive one, I think the largest demonstration in the history of American Jewry for freeing Soviet Jews in 1987. And sort of flying on this uh, rising, this cresting wave of uh, American greatness and of American Jewish um, uh, strength and achievement, Joe, Joe Lieberman uh, won his race for the U.S. Senate in 1988. Uh, he ran as a moderate Democrat, which is what he was. He was a hawk and an internationalist in foreign policy, staunchly pro Israel. He was an Orthodox Jew. He supported in 2003 the U.S. Uh, war in Iraq following 9-11 in 2001. I think he was a member of the 9-11 uh, Commission, but he was instrumental in founding the Department of Homeland Security following those attacks in 2000 because he was moderate and because he was seen as a distinguished and, uh, and morally upright uh, senator. Al Gore chose Joe Lieberman as his running mate when he ran for president. And that also was sort of a high watermark that he was seen as the as Gore's rabbi, the Orthodox Jew, the first Jew to appear on a national electoral ticket as as vice presidential candidate. Joe Lieberman was at the pinnacle of his success and American Jury was very much at the pinnacle of its political power in 2000. And of course, uh, Al Gore lost those elections, and it was really at the end of the elections when we saw the Democrats for the first time really rejecting the legitimacy of the outcome of those elections over hanging chads, if you remember, in Florida, and the question of whether or not the elections had been stolen, even though they were fairly well proven to have not been stolen, and that Bush actually legitimately won the state of Florida. What we saw there in November, December of 2000, when the Democrats were rejecting the outcome of the elections, is that the first appearance, really, of a new phenomenon in American politics, which was this hard, um, brittle core on the left wing of the Democratic Party 
that was increasingly rejecting the concept of bipartisanship, of moderation in American politics, and viewing politics as a blood sport, winner-takes-all, zero-sum game. That was the first real appearance of that new, angry tone to American politics was in the acrimonious end of the 2000 elections with very powerful forces inside of the Democratic Party rejecting the legitimacy of the outcome. And then in the in the, in the eight years that followed, also rejecting the legitimacy of George W. Bush's presidency as a result of their continued contention that the 2000 race had been stolen. Um, and Lieberman remained in the Senate. He ran for re-election at the same time as he was running for vice president, and he won. Um, and then in 2004, he decided to run uh, for president in the Democratic primaries. In the event, he left early. He didn't receive any delegates. But something very important, another watershed moment after the 2000 elections occurred in the 2004 Democratic primaries, which was for the first time we saw the rise of an organization called MoveOn.org. MoveOn.org was sort of the precursor of a lot of these I don't know what they're called now. Um, they're like PACs where there are political influence operations, dark money, soft money that goes into funding politics in a major way uh, today. In 2004, you had an organization called MoveOn.org, which was one of the pioneers of internet fundraising and campaigning. It was funded by two Jewish American far left billionaires, um, Peter Singer and, and George Soros. And their idea essentially had been to uh, to stack both state governments and national uh, and national uh, positions in in the Congress and in and in the White House with people who were very very far to the left, uh, opposed the war in Iraq, which was still raging at that time, and were also very anti-Israel. So, in two thousand and four, uh, one of the one of the Democratic candidates was a former Vermont governor named Howard Dean, who was of no real note. Nobody had ever heard of him. He was sort of a moderate. He was a hawk on international affairs following 9-11 in particular. But suddenly he started becoming the recipient of very, very large donations from MoveOn.org. And he became a mouthpiece for this new strain of American politics on the left, very angry, very radical uh, anti-war, anti-the war in Iraq, anti-Bush, obviously, uh, demonizing uh, political opponents as such. And his appearance really shocked uh, the Democratic Party and in a way transformed the Democratic Party because the other uh, candidates for office were rattled by Howard Dean's very strong anti-war positioning. And they moved away from their previous support for the U.S. war effort in Iraq the only Democratic candidate that did not abandon his support for the war in Iraq was Joe Lieberman, who said, no, I believe in this. I'm going to continue. I'm staying the course. And as far as I'm concerned, George Bush is, of course, a legitimate president. He, having been the, the running mate with Al Gore, he rejected the conspiracy theories surrounding the outcome of the 2000 elections. He said George Bush is the president, and he loyally served him as a moderate Democrat in the Senate. And he continued to support the war in Iraq throughout the course of his career. He never, he never walked away from his positions. He thought it was the right thing to do, and he never wavered in that support. So that was Joe Lieberman in 2004. And what happened after he took this principled stand for the things that he believed in as a Democratic uh, candidate in the Democratic presidential primaries in 2004? Well... Uh, George Soros and Peter Lewis and the other uh, multi-billionaire Democratic donors far to the left uh, decided to take him out of the Senate. In 2006, this was really a watershed event, not only in American polit politics, but specifically in American Jewish politics, because he faced a primary challenge in the 2006 uh, Senate elections for, to be reelected to the Senate in 2006. His challenger was a man named Ned Lamont, who is now the governor of Connecticut. And Ned Lamont was supported by MoveOn.org as well. And the notable aspect of the Democratic president uh, Senate primaries in Connecticut in 2007 was the prevalence and uh, the prevalence for the first time 
of open anti-Semitic rhetoric directed against uh, Joe Lieberman that was embraced or at least accepted in silence, not only by Ned Lamont, who was the chief, the direct beneficiary of it, but of leading luminaries in the Democratic Party, first and foremost among them, Lieberman's longtime friend, Hillary Clinton, who at that time was a senator in New York, from New York. And I'll just give you, I looked it up because I wrote about it pretty extensively at the time. And um, so I just want to give you a couple of the things that were said about Lieberman in the 2006 Democratic primaries. So this was from Propaganda Post on the MoveOn.org website. Uh, postings repeatedly referred to Lieberman as the Jew Lieberman and Zionazi Lieberman. These attacks were by no means unusual. Anti-Semitic slurs against Israel and Jewish Americans and belittlements of the Holocaust regularly appeared on the MoveOn.org website. Okay? Um, and just to give a sense of how open and readily moveon.org used anti-semitic even pro-nazi rhetoric uh in one post which was a representative post a member of moveon.org compared george w bush negatively to adolf hitler saying that adolf hitler was actually better than george bush they wrote bush is no hitler hitler was a socialist and believed in something besides money he didn't not dodge real military service and he believed at least in germany which was a real nation and not a corporation like the u.s moreover hitler did not use depleted depleted uranium and phosphorus to burn people alive well he used cyclone b um anyway he did not condone the torture of prisoners for fun uh, to relieve stress so here's holocaust denial right and hitler praise um, all in the in an effort to demonize George Bush, who is worse than Hitler, um, and so this was uh, this led to uh, Lamont's particularly uh, Hillary Clinton's refusal to endorse her friend um, Lieberman or to condemn the anti-Semitism that was just so prominent in Lamont's um, in Lamont's uh, I don't know, it wasn't his direct campaign, but it was. MoveOn.org's campaign on behalf of Lamont that really uh, tipped the balance in favor of Lamont. Lamont won the Democratic primary, and then Lieberman, supported by Republicans, vote ran as an independent in the general election and won. But he was an independent. He was never again elected as a Democrat. So Lieb and he also never ran for re-election again because by 20 2012, the situation in American politics under Obama had become ever more radicalized and the place for somebody like Lieberman in the U.S. Senate or really anywhere in national politics had been vastly reduced. So during his last term in the Senate from 2000 to 2012, Lieberman disappointed the Republicans because he caucused with the Democrats, which gave them an effective majority of 51 seats, I think it was, in the Senate. And um, so Republicans were upset because it was Republican voters who had given him the victory against Lamont in the general election. But be that as it may, you have to ask, well, then why didn't Lieberman go with the Republicans and give them give them the the majority? And I think that the answer and I wrote about this as well at the time, because I was disappointed with him because the Republicans by 2006 were vastly more pro-Israel than the Democrats were. Uh, but anyway, he wasn't just thinking about Israel. He wasn't, despite the claims of dual loyalty or singular loyalty to Israel and the way that he was reviled, Lieberman was an American patriot and he was also a uh, liberal on a lot of issues. And that's why he caucused with the Democrats. He supported gay marriage. He supported green energy and believed in, you know, the whole global warming thing and thought that it was a threat. And so he supported these democratic initiatives and programs. And that's why he wanted to caucus with them, because he was, in his mind, still a Democrat. The Democrats had been his party. And just because he was forced to run as an independent, because the Democrats in his home state had turned not only against him and voted for Lamont, but turned against Jews by voting for Lamont in an openly anti-Semitic campaign against him, and his own party's leadership, particularly Hillary Clinton at the time, who was the most prominent Democrat in 2006, abandoned him and opted to go with 
of the radicals, with the anti-Semites, with the MoveOn.org uh, funders, because that's where the new energy, the new money, the new momentum of the party was. But here I just want to make one more point. Towards the end of 2006, at the same time that Soros and Lewis and MoveOn.org were running this anti-Semitic campaign against um, Joe Lieberman in the Senate primaries, they were also gearing up together with other Jewish anti-Zionist billionaires like the Bravmans, who were the uh, money behind the Israel Policy Forum and other groups to form a new Jewish organization that was going to be a lobby whose purpose was to undermine the legitimacy and fight APAC on Israel-related issues. So it's supposed to be a Jewish lobby that was going to be the voice of several different post-Zionist or anti-Zionist American Jewish groups. Um, and its purpose was to split the American Jewish community over support for Israel. And lo and behold, at the end of 2007, we saw the appearance for the first time of an organization called J Street. By the way, also in 2007, this is all part of legitimizing the idea that there's something inherently illegitimate about American Jews who support Israel and American non-Jews who support uh, Israel. In 2007, we saw the publication of the Israel lobby, which was the uh, sort of updated version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion written by two esteemed professors, Steve Wald from Harvard and John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago, where they asserted the existence of a an amorphous blob of pro-Israel lobbying groups whose purpose was to render American politics subservient to the interests of the state of Israel um, and uh, all of the concepts of Jews controlling the media, of Jews, com uh, Jews uh, controlling American foreign policy, of Jews being effectively traitorous because they're pushing policies that are inherently antithetical to American uh, American interests because it's not in America's interest to support Israel. All of those things became uh, sort of the accepted, the received wisdom of, of in academic circles and in elite opinion in the United States, not the only accepted wisdom, it was it was heartily fought by many, many uh, prominent Democrats and others. But the appearance, the publication of the Israel lobby uh, was also a watershed moment in American in American politics and American public life because it put out there this thesis, this full blown thesis that there's something inherently evil about Jews uh, advancing their own interests and therefore having full civil rights in the United States, um, that Jews were only allowed to really operate on this level if they were not pro-Israel. And by the way, that uh, uh, that book, The Israel Lobby, came out in 2007, came out um, a, a year earlier, a long essay that presented the exact same thesis by the same authors, by Professors Mearsheimer and Walt, came out in the New York Review of Books. Um, and so the, the two of them, the initial essay and then the book, um, had a profound effect on what you were allowed to say in American politics. And then at the same time that they came out, again, on the heels of Lieberman's defeat in the Democratic primaries in 2007, you had the formation of of J Street just in time to support Obama in the Democratic primaries against Hillary Clinton in 2007 and 2008. And J Street presented itself as pro-Israel and pro-peace, meaning that the APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, was just pro-Israel and anti-peace, right? And so by saying we were pro-peace, with APAC being pro-Israel, then J Street was essentially trying to seize the mantle of morality from, from APAC and presenting APAC as a warmonger. And at the time when you had Americans really rent and divided over the issue of the Iraq war and whether it was a moral war and a just war and whether the United States was properly engaged in that, whether the United States was losing it, whether there was a purpose to this war, et cetera, 
or whether it was just futile and wrong that for the United States to have ever engaged in this war, um, the idea that uh, APAC was a warmongering operation that just was interested in prolonging the war in Iraq and Israel was to blame for the war in Iraq was a central part of the thesis because American support for Israel enraged the Arab world and set the Arab world against the United States. And if the United States weren't supporting Israel, then you know, people like Saddam Hussein would never have been a problem. Iran wouldn't be a problem. Syria's uh, Assad's would not have been problematic for the United States. The only reason that they are is because Israel gets American support. So that's the basic idea. And and so you had this you had this uh, new lobby, which was saying to the American Jews, you know, unconditional support for Israel and Israel's right to defend itself, that's really counterproductive and it's not really pro-Israel because, you know, Israel is is to blame for everything that's happening in the Middle East. And really to be pro-Israel means to protect Israel from itself. J Jeremy Ben Ami uh, J Street's executive director and founding director said that Israel needs tough love from the United States. And the idea was put all the blame for everything that happens in the Middle East on Israel, blame it, blame its supporters for supporting it and saying that Israel was the problem and what the United States needs to do for Israel's own interest is to block Israel from ever actually defi decisively defeating its own enemies and um, and to really decouple America from Israel because you know, the whole thing is just, it's just antithetical to America's national interests. So J Street came in, and, you know, one of the most pernicious things that happened as a result of of, APA, of uh, J Street, and this is precisely what, what was the idea behind the entire organization. Soros set it out in a 2006 essay. I think it was also published in the New York Review of Books when he was presenting the concept of an anti-Israel Jewish lobby um, that was going to compete with APAC. So, you know, that it was to divide the American Jewish community. And so while you see the rise of anti-Semitic forces, the Islamist forces in places like uh, New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, and other places that saw the downfall of Stephen Rothman in 2008, or similarly inclined Americans in Connecticut that brought down uh, Lieberman in the 2006 Democratic primaries, and so on and so forth, um, you saw as well the the, the simultaneous um, sort of, it's not exactly a civil war, but um, um, rising disagreements and incoherence in the American Jewish community over what is support for Israel. What does it mean to be pro-Israel? And the Obama wing, the J Street wing of the Democratic Party um, reduced support for Israel to essentially being anti-Israel. That was J Street's position, because if Israel's to blame for everything, then the way to be pro-Israel is to be anti-Israel. So it's putting everything on its head. So saying, you want to support Palestinian statehood no matter what, that's to be pro-Israel, because what really Israel needs is to build a Palestinian state. And same thing with Iran. You know, Opposing Iran's nuclear ambitions um, harms Israel because... Um, because, and we know reasons, and so really the way to be pro-Israel is to support uh, the nuclear appeasement of Iran and paving their way to a nuclear weapon, and that, that's basically been the goal, is that anything that's pro-Israel is bad, and it's actually anti-Israel because Israel doesn't know what's good for it, and the things that are bad for Israel, like Iran getting nuclear weapons or Palestinians building a terrorist state that is you know, organized around the principle of annihilating the Jews, like that's actually good for Israel because what Israel really needs is a is a Palestinian state. And here I think it's important to note that you know, I think I hope it's a high water mark, but I I don't know that it is. But to date, the high water mark in terms of the achievement of the confusion of the disruption of the disarray of the American Jewish community over the issue of what it means to even be pro-Israel. Like is it? anti-Semitic to say that you want you support the annihilation of the Jewish state. Well, duh, yeah, but there's a lot of confusion inside of the community and it's deliberately, was deliberately fomented and maintained and expanded by J Street and its uh, billionaire uh, 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 funders, etc. So um, the high watermark really came uh, a couple of weeks ago when 
Schumer, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, Senator Schumer said, turned on Israel in his uh, speech at the at the Senate. And here, I think it's also important to note. I mean, you could, I was doing like this <laughs> excavation of all of these articles that I had written in the past about these things to try to remember after after Senator Lieberman passed away. And I wrote this article in the Post, in the Jerusalem Post in uh, 2015 called American Jewry's Fateful Hour. And it was about the fight about uh, uh, Obama's uh, nuclear program with Iran, nuclear, nuclear deal with Iran, because in a way, it, it was a turning point in the sense that as I argued at the time, and I think, uh, I and I and and I think time has borne me out that Obama, you know, he had made a deal uh, with the with the Senate, which was crazy to say. Okay, the uh, nuclear deal is not really a uh, treaty, even though it fundamentally changed everything about America's non nuclear non proliferation positions. Um, and therefore, it was an international treaty. But to be an international treaty, you needed the support, the affirmative support of two thirds of the senators in the U.S. Senate, and there was no way Obama didn't have fifty senators. So instead of doing that, he turned the Constitution on the head on its head, and he passed this. Um, he pa- he got the Senate to pass a law that said that for the purposes of the nuclear deal, all you needed were for. Um, one third of the senators uh, not to vote no, so that you needed, instead of a two thirds affirmative majority to pass uh, a treaty, you needed only, you needed two thirds to oppose the uh, nuclear deal in order to prevent it. So that was what Obama was able to achieve. And as a result, it was able to pass, even though the majority of US senators in 2015 oppose the nuclear deal with Iran. And one of the weird aspects to that process, which was pretty easy, Obama had 33 senators to to sign on to the nuclear deal. He was going to be able to get them. And yet the fight that he waged against American Jewish opposition to the nuclear deal was like a nuclear war that it was uh it was almost a blood sport that he went after them with everything that he had the wall street journal reported they exposed uh, if you remember that NSA intercepts the national security Author- uh, agencies uh eavesdropping on on Trump on president Trump and his advisors during the transition period etc well the first time that the NSA that we know about was used against domestic opponents in the United States of Obama was with in 2014-2015 when the NSA started intercepting the communications of APAC officials related to their fight against the nuclear deal. And um, what I wrote at the time was that it was all seemed to be overkill. Why didn't you just let the American Jews have their fight? It was doomed to fail because all Obama needed were a third of the votes. And why was he going after them and demonizing them as warmongers and as disloyal to the United States and in the hands of, and the politicians who opposed the deal were in the pockets of, you know, deep pocketed uh, uh, donors and these open dog whistles that were obviously directed against Jewish donors. Why would he do that? And I think that the answer was that he wanted to destroy American Jewish power. And so one of the victims of this was, um, and by the way, I just have to give this part on, on Hillary Clinton that I totally forgot about. So Hillary Clinton had not really been a very strong supporter of the nuclear deal because she was running for president and the majority of Democrats and the majority of Americans totally opposed it. So she completely changed her tune. Listen to this. On Tuesday, the Democratic presidential frontrunner and former Secretary of State ratcheted up her statements of support for Obama's nuclear pact with the Ayatollahs. Speaking to supporters in New Hampshire, Clinton said, I'm hoping that the agreement is finally approved and I'm telling you, if it's not, all bets are off. What does that mean? On its face, Clinton's mounting support for the deal makes little sense. True or principal rival for the Democratic nomination, Socialist Senator Bernie Sanders announced his support. But this deal will probably not be an issue by the time the Democrats begin voting in their primaries. On the other hand, the deal is not at all popular 
among either the general public or key Democratic donors. According to a poll taken this week by Monmouth University, only 27 percent of the general population and only 43 percent of Democrats want Congress to support the deal. And then I went into, you know, her donors might not like it because she had to raise, she wanted to raise $2.5 billion for the 26th election. So why would she be going against major Jewish donors, et cetera? And then I said, the same day Clinton escalated her support for the deal, the FBI seized Clinton's private email server and her thumb drive amid reports that the inspector general of the U.S. intelligence community concluded that there were top secret communications on her email server. Simply storing top secret communications, let alone disseminating them, is a felony offense. Clinton submitted more than 32,000 emails from her survey server to the State Department. A random sample of 40 emails showed up four classified documents, two of which were top secret. If the same ratio is held for the rest of the email she submitted, then she may have illegally held some 3,200 classified documents, 1,600 of which were top secret. And then it went on and on. She'd be in big trouble, um, yada, yada, yada. But there is one person who can protect her if Obama wishes to close or expand the criminal probe of Clinton's suspected criminal activities. He can. As Roger Simon from PJMedia.com wrote this week, Hillary Clinton is in such deep legal trouble, trouble over her emails that she needs the backing of Obama to survive. He controls the attorney general's office and therefore he controls Hillary and her freedom as long as he is president. Nice. And then I go on to Schumer. Because Schumer, I'll get, I want to talk about him in in the sort of context of Lieberman in just a second. Then there's Obama's treatment of Ch Senator Charles Schumer. Last Thursday night, the senior senator from New York and the next in line to lead the Democratic minority in the Senate informed Obama that he will oppose his nuclear deal. Schumer asked Obama to keep Schumer's position to himself in order to enable Schumer to announce it on Friday morning. Okay, so the night before he was about to uh, announce it, and we're talking again about when August of 2015. So it's the height of it's the height of the debate in the United States about the nuclear deal. Here we go. So where is that? Kind of just lots. Okay. Rather than respect Schumer's wishes, the White House set its leftist attack dogs on Schumer. By the time Schumer announced his plan to the, oppose the deal, he had been called a traitor a warmonger, and an Israeli agent by leftist activist groups who pledged to withhold campaign contributions. Schumer was compared to former Connecticut senior Senator Joseph Lieberman. Lieberman was forced to face a primary challenge in his 2006 re-election uh, bid. His opponent, Led Lamont, was generously supported by leftist activists led by George Soros. Okay. White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest threatened that Schumer could expect to be challenged in his bid to replace outgoing Democratic State Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid when Reid retires next year. So then what it, why, so that responding to the onslaught against him while maintaining his opposition to the deal, Schumer reportedly told his Democratic Senate colleagues that while he was opposing the deal, he would not lobby them to join him in the opposition. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Schumer did not lobby anybody. Uh, his uh, Kristen Gillibrand, uh, the junior senator, for instance, from New York State, she supported the nuclear deal, as did, you know, the many, many other Democrats, which is why it passed. And if he had put his thumb on the scales against the nuclear deal, it's possible that it wouldn't have passed. It's possible that it wouldn't even had gotten the 33 senators to vote in favor of it and because again only 26 percent of americans supported it was deeply unpopular among democrats as well only 43 percent of democrats supported it so there was reason to think that you know there was hope schumer said never mind he was accused of being a you know a dirty jew an agent of israel etc so what was the purpose why did they keep going on with this anti-semitic frenzy and I think that the answer is because Obama wanted to destroy the legitimacy of Jewish political power in the United States. It started with Lieberman, then you see with Schumer. And I think that it's almost, I don't know, poetic, but that the last article that 
uh, that Joe Lieberman wrote and published in the it is published it just a week ago on on March twentieth in the Wall Street Journal. So a week before he passed away, he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal attacking Schumer for uh, calling for regime change in Israel from the Senate floor. The article was titled, Schumer has crossed a red line over Israel. And then the subtitle was, his speech last week is evidence that his party is catering to those who are hostile to the Jewish state. And it has been, right, since 2006, since Lieberman was ousted from the Democratic Party through the Democratic primary challenge by Ned Lamont that was fueled by anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric and funded by anti-Zionist uh, Jewish donors, George Soros and Peter Lewis through moveon.org. And, you know, it's a great article. It's hard to believe that he passed away. And he says here, I mean, it's really worth reading the whole thing and, um, and we, we can link to it. But he said here, uh, Mr. Schumer's statement will have every other Democratic ally of the United States worrying that America may try to bully our way into its domestic politics that will diminish our allies' loyalty to us. Without dependable allies, we will have a much harder time protecting America's security, prosperity, and freedom. You know, he, he said here, because, I mean, because what, what did Schumer say? He not only said that Israel had to oust Netanyahu, he also said that if the Israeli people in their uh, in their idiocy, as far as he's concerned, decide to keep Netanyahu in power, oh, then the United States is going to come after it. Because he said then the United States, Schumer said, will have no choice but to play a more active role in shaping Israel's policy by using our leverage to change the present course. So this is exactly right. So when Schumer said this, it was exactly the fake pro-Israel policy that has been propounded by J Street since its inception in 2007, when they came in and started disassembling the American Jewish community by putting in this concept that being anti-Israel is actually being pro-Israel. So here Schumer came to the Senate floor, the same floor that Lieberman walked on, you know, from 1989 to 2014, right? And he said, he said, the Israeli people don't know how to choose. And here I, the uh, Democratic uh, majority leader, in this U.S. Senate, as a Jew, I'm going to tell you guys, as a Jew, right, that you don't know how to govern yourself, and that the United States is being more pro-Israel than Prime Minister Netanyahu is being when we tell you enough is enough, you can't win your war with Hamas, get a ceasefire, don't go into Rafah, we, we demand that you establish a Palestinian terror state, just like the one, by the way, in Gaza, from which you were invaded, and 1,200 Israelis were slaughtered in a sadistic in psychotic way on October 7th. Um, and that's what Schumer did. He embraced the concept that anti-Israel is actually pro-Israel that was propounded first uh, by J Street in 2006, 2007, moveon.org as a precursor to J Street in 2004 and 2006, the first victim of all of this being Senator Lieberman. So Senator Lieberman left politics in 2013 with his honor intact. He never abandoned the things that he believed in, whether it was, you know, global warming, um, social change, or a, a strong America uh, as the primary superpower that was using its power in order to promote freedom abroad, and that Israel, the Jewish state, as a fellow democracy, was a, a, a natural and powerful U.S. ally in its in its fight, in its quest to bring freedom to the world, and by doing so, also secure American national security. And, you know, there's a lot of debate over whether Lieberman's concept of American security being a guarantor, or Amer American of America's freedom agenda being a, any way to guarantee America's national security. But there's no doubt that his belief in that came from the depths of his soul. And that's why he never changed. And Schumer, on the other hand, when he saw which side the bread was buttered on, completely changed. He started out as a pro-Israel hawk. And today, as we saw, and as Lieberman attacked him for, he spoke from the well of the Senate uh, and essentially said that Israel has no right to democracy, that Israeli democracy is fundamentally illegitimate. 
because we're not choosing the way that he wants us to choose, which of course goes back already to full circle to the 2000 presidential elections when for the first time you saw the Democrats saying that the choice of the American people in the state of Florida in 2000 was incorrect and illegitimate and therefore Bush had not been legitimately elected and they were not going to accept the results of the 2000 elections and they continued to demonize him in a, in a, in a way that I don't think we had really seen certainly not in my lifetime in American politics, which were always ugly, but they were unprecedentedly so uh, during the Bush administration. And of course, it's only gotten worse since that. I think la at, in recent years, uh, Lieberman was one of the founders of the No Labels uh, political group that was trying to put together you know, a bipartisan list of moderates to run in the presidential election. Um, and the idea was to try to, he was fighting in 2024 as a leader of the No Labels group. He was fighting the same people that ousted him from power, not power, but from the Democratic Party in 2006. He's still trying to build that middle ground, rebuild it in American politics. And, you know, it's argued, it's arguable. And I, I think it's true that American politics have unfortunately passed a point of no return, maybe if you can have the four years of quiet or something like that under a second Trump term, something that's probably not likely, but just to bring a sense of norm normality back into American life after so many years of chaos that were instigated, I think, by the Democrat uh, Party's rejection of the legitimacy of the 2000 elections, then you know maybe you'll be able to start seeing empowered voices for moderation, for bipartisanship, and for a, a rebuilding of um, the American ethos around the American creed, which was something that always guided the United States. I think, you know, when we look at at Lieberman's life in politics and also in, and his fall from political power, um, it tracks one to one with the rise of anger and emotion as the basis for political organization in the United States and and concomitant with that the rise of political anti-Semitism in the United States as a as a mobilizing force in politics uh, to the detriment to, of American Jews with groups like moveon.org and J Street playing um, a leading role and a pivotal role in undermining and destroying Jewish civil rights and political power to the point where Jews who want to advocate on behalf of Israel are now uh, just being booted out of the public square in cities and obviously on college campuses around the country. And the issue of college campuses just brings me to the last thing that I want to talk about, and only really briefly because I've said it time already. I'm spending, I've, I've used up enough of your time today talking about Lieberman. Um, but there were two polls that came out, the... Uh, the Gallup poll and the Harvard Harris poll, and the Harvard Harris poll talks specifically about American positions on the war. And what we see is just like in 2006 and 2008 and 2015 with the Iran nuclear deal, that the vast majority of Americans believe that Israel is in the right. Um, and today, still, despite the demonization of Israel's war effort in the media and by the Biden administration and others. Um, you still see that in February, 80, um, 82% of Americans supported Israel, and today 79% do against Hamas, um, and 21% Hamas, 18% last in, in February. So you see, by and large, American support for Israel holding steady. Two-thirds of Americans support Israel's, um, uh, uh, that uh, the idea that a ceasefire can only be achieved with the hostages being released. 77% of Americans oppose an, an, any any survival of Hamas at the end of the war, etc. So you see a very strong American support for it. And then the Gallup polls seem to show the opposite picture of a collapse of American support for Israel, but that's not exactly true because they didn't ask specifically about the handling of the war. Rather, they asked about Israel. What you found here is that young Americans are deeply hostile towards Israel, which I guess is what you would expect for people who spend their time on campuses which are deeply anti-Semitic, institutionally anti-Semitic in many, many cases, and also on social media in places like TikTok, right, where most of the content on TikTok 
is deeply anti-Semitic political content, because that's what China wants to have being, you know, uh, pumped into the American political and and uh, and moral character uh, today is anti-Semitism. So I think, you know, these obviously are things that Joe Biden, that, that Joe Lieberman opposed. Joe Lieberman opposed violence and computer games. I mean, he understood the power of, of, of gaming and of internet for pushing irrational hatred, violence, and other things into the American bloodstream. So, you know, he was, he was a, I, I mean, I, I differed with him on a lot of things and I was really disappointed when he caucused with the Democrats in 2006 and in, in, in his last, uh, in his last, uh, term of office, but he was really an amazing leader in the United States. He believed in what he believed. He was a conviction politician. He stood for what he believed in. He held for what he believed in. And he lived by his ideals. So he he was he was a great man. And his loss, his death is really a loss for American politics. It's a loss for the for the Jews. That he was such a proud member of our people. Um and I guess uh, in in addition to giving our condolences to the Lieberman part family, I think we have to give our condolences to the American people that they lost such an extraordinary leader and hope that a time will come when people like Joe Lieberman um, will find their way back to leadership roles in the United States uh, Senate and in other places and people who are more concerned with uh, the cu- headlines in any paper on any given day and what is said about them um, and bowing to bullies in order to weather whatever storm that they'll find their way increasingly out of politics. So anyway, those are my thoughts for today. And I'll see you guys uh, again next week. And don't forget, we have a great interview with Patricia Hutton coming up uh, on the Carolyn Glick Show. Take care. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.